morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and occasionally Auto House of Naples, but not today. Uh, today I've got another one from Dave the Wholesaler. And uh, I have to say, I'm again very thankful to Dave. You know, he's given me some cars that I otherwise probably wouldn't have had. I, in fact, I for sure wouldn't have had. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, I just don't gravitate towards the newer stuff. And Dave does. And uh, as such, when I get something from him, it tends to be a fairly newer car. And it keeps me up to date, which uh, is an important thing because, you know, God knows you don't want to become an old crabby dinosaur. Uh, it's the last thing you want to become. And uh, that's that's what I'm always constantly in danger of becoming. So uh, Dave is uh, doing his best to keep me fresh and current and many thanks go out to him. So uh, it's been incredibly quiet up until the moment that I started this video and now all of a sudden we have planes overhead and uh, in fact it sounds like a loud one. We might be under attack but we'll see. Hopefully it just goes on its way. Uh, animals have been at an absolute minimum. Minimum. I haven't seen a bird, a squirrel, a deer, a goat, nothing. Uh, it's just absolutely fantastic. And uh, really it feels like things are going my way. Even the weather is terrific right now. Uh, it's like 63 degrees. It's not going to get much warmer than that today. We've got a cool front coming in. We've got really nice weather for the foreseeable future. Not really the freezes that I'm looking for, but certainly good enough to keep me chipper. So uh, for the first time in a long time, as of today, I really don't have any complaints. And that's, uh, you know, that's something akin to a miracle. Uh, I did spend the last week at Mecham uh, up in Kissimmee. I mean, you know, it's an incredible event. You had, the, what, like 3,500 collector cars. Ten days it went on, from Thursday uh, all the way through the very next Sunday. I mean, just an unbelievable amount of cars and basically anything that you could ever hope to see. Uh, I took a few pictures. Maybe I'll scatter them in here. I didn't take many. Uh, mostly, I just dicked around the auction. I opted for that gold pass thing, which is shockingly expensive because I knew I'd been there for, I'd be there for a while. Uh, so I was able to get plenty of free beer. Free is an interesting word for it. Uh, but, uh, I was, uh, you know, basically just between the whiskey, the beer, and the cars, I was just sort of moping my way around the auction in a confused state. And uh, I thought about checking in from there, but I just couldn't put it together. I just didn't feel it. So here I am back and uh, back in the swing of things, and we're going to get things going. So look, I'm not, and there's so much to cover with this car that I can't just ramble on the way that I usually do. And we're going to have to dive directly straight into it uh, at this point. And this is a 2021 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray Convertible. There it is. It's been out for a couple of years now. Uh, obviously, it's made quite an impact. And uh, the number one thing, let me just get this out of the way. This is the number one thing. Let me just say this. The cleaning of the inside front windshield is a deal killer for me on this car. An absolute deal killer. I mean, it sucks the big one. I can't even blame Dalton if he were to do a shit job on it. I tried it last night. Uh, I got this car, again, from Dave, so it really didn't go through the Dalton process, which is fine because Dalton really doesn't clean things up at all and sometimes they end up dirtier after he gets them but he didn't get this one so the windshield being dirty was on me so I decided to clean it yesterday before I took it out uh, this morning and man what a pain in the giant ass I have to tell you I mean I, I it was basically winded afterwards I mean leaning pulling the steering wheel forward to try and get leverage uh, the passenger side was a little bit easier but it was an absolute friggin nightmare and uh, frankly it was too much for me it's just not something that I would want to contend with so uh, if I was and I am one of these 50 plus year old pot bellied midlife crisis guys uh, I'm probably gonna end up opting for the Dodge Hellcat because it just has a much easier 
easier to clean windshield and uh, that's um, you know plenty of horsepower and man is it easier to clean the windshield so that's that and that's maybe the sum total of this review so no matter how good this car is or how bad it is forget it if uh, you're not into really really contorting yourself to clean windshields then it's just not the car for you number two thing I'm a bit torn on this car um, well, I'm almost instantly not a fan of any kind of new, modern, high-tech machine. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm getting, oh, there are the birds. Now they're coming in. Now they're coming in. Staging themselves over there. If those things attack me, God. We'll see, now they're flying off. But anyway, look, I'm not immediately a fan of any kind of new high-tech car. Never have been, uh, at least in the last few years, and just sort of eschew it. Because I think for the most part, uh, they just don't have any kind of a soul. Uh, but uh, I am torn on this one, because I am a fan of Corvette. I mean, have been for a long time. Uh, have always loved Corvettes, have always followed them, and uh, I've been sympathetic to the dream of a mid-engine Chevy supercar for, uh, you know, decades. It's something that they've been threatening for absolute decades, and finally, finally it's here. Even if it's well beyond the vintage of cars that I find the most entertaining, uh, I definitely have to admit that it's still a cause for celebration. And uh, number three... <laughs> I'll just keep on going by the numbers. Uh, it's not really the first mid-engine Corvette. I mean, at least, and I don't mean just the, you know, the half dozen or so mid-engine concept cars that Corvette uh, and Chevy came out with over the years. I mean, it's not even the first mid-engine production Corvette. In the ultimate technical sense, uh, any car with, well, how can I put this? This is a mid rear engine placement. But the 1963 Corvette, which was of course engineered by Duntov and a bunch of car guys, we'll get into Zora Arcos Duntov in a minute, uh, was technically a front mid-engine Corvette. And um, well, look, cars like any front-drive Honda, Accord, or Datsun Sentra, they put their running gear up front. It's between the front axle or even in front of it. And they can trace its roots back to the first Mini Cooper, which put almost all of its mechanicals in front of the front wheels. And they did that in order to create as much passenger and cargo space as possible behind it. Uh, that was maybe the... Uh, predecessor to every modern front-engine shitbox econobox that you drive now. Uh, you look at the Porsche 911, which of course traces its roots back to the uh, ass-engine Beetle, and that puts all of its running gear behind the rear wheels, behind the rear axle, uh, in the middle and behind, and that's very technically a rear-engine car. Uh, any car that puts its engine and mechanicals in between the axles could be called a mid-engine car. So the Corvette from 1963 onward was very technically a front mid-engine rear car, which makes this the first rear mid-engine, uh, you know, car that uh, Chevrolet has produced. But I mean, look, let's leave that to the geeks at, uh, at Popular Mechanics, because in the common parlance, and as most people will refer to it and understand it, uh, this is the first mid-engine Corvette, and, uh, you know, America, fuck yeah. That, that's all I can say about that. Um, it was Zora Arkos Duntov, if you know that guy, and we've talked about him, and I'll put some other Corvette reviews in there where I've gone through who he is and what he is and how he came to be, so we're not going to get crazy, because again, this is going to end up being a two-hour video if I have to keep going through everything, which I'm just not going to do, uh, but he's known as the father of the Corvette. He's not the guy who originally invented it or came up with it, uh, but he is the guy who made it into what it became, and uh, he was an immigrant engineer. He saw the first Corvette at the New York Motorama, which was a GM auto show, fell in love with the styling of it, but thought the uh, mechanicals of it were absolute shit. So he forced GM to hire him, basically. He wrote them a letter saying he could make it a lot better. And, uh, you know, with some negotiation, he did end up getting hired and became the head of GM's performance program and Corvette development and did everything he could to make the Corvette a real sports car. Uh, he had it fuel and 
injection, he added an independent rear suspension, four-wheel disc brakes, and uh, basically took it from sort of a concept and style and personal luxury uh, into a true sports car, which you could say the second generation, the mid-year Corvettes were, and uh, they were probably the pinnacle of his efforts in terms of making it a sports car. Uh, but despite all of those improvements, uh, Duntop knew that the limitations made by having a front engine rear wheel drive car would ultimately harm the progress of the Corvette. So he started coming up with a plan to make it a mid-engine car. And uh, he introduced what they called the CERV-1. Uh, obviously, when it came out, it wasn't the one. It was just the C... Oh, for the love of God, there it goes. Every time I think I'm going to silence that thing, and then I never do. But anyway, you have the CERV-1, which came out in 1960. Uh, it was basically an open wheel. It looked a little bit like those Le Mans racers of the 50s, you know, with the uh, small body in the middle and all the open wheel. Uh, but it was mid-engined, rear-wheel drive, and uh, it, even though it was designed basically to test the limits of suspension at the time, uh, it was a way for him to weasel in some uh, GM endorsed uh, mid-engined engineering and uh, became a fairly big deal and that's just a neat car and and it was fun to look at um, the serve 2 the CERV 2 was built in 1964 and it was styled by uh, the very famous Larry Shinoda um, kind of the Mr. Miyagi of uh, engine sorry of Corvette styling maybe automotive styling he went to Ford later and designed the 67 Mustang but he was an incredible guy had been in internment camp and some other stuff, Japanese-American, but uh, he helped design the CERV-2, which was now full-bodied, but also mid-engined and uh, designed to push the limits of that design. Uh, it did 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds and ran a top speed of 214 miles an hour, which were absolutely shocking numbers for the time, and Duntov was thrilled. He wanted to race the cars at Le Mans, lobby GM to do so. Uh, but, uh, you know, GM constantly raining on Duntov's parade. Instead, went with some chaparrales and uh, put the kibosh on poor uh, Duntov's mid-engine stuff. But, uh, you know, Duntov was not a guy to be deterred and not a guy to take no for an answer. So he just kept working away at things. And um, he came up with another mid-engine prototype. Uh, in the um, in the late 1960s, uh, called the XP, what was it, like the 882 or something, um, which was a very interesting car. Again, this one much more styled like a Corvette and uh, was very much loved and beloved by the engineers at the time. Uh, it was put, it, the, the kibosh was put on it by none other than uh, John Z. DeLorean, uh, who didn't want to see the Corvette as this radical pushing the limits thing that would, um, you know, be expensive to make and not be very high profit. He wanted it instead to be very profitable. So he was angling towards pushing the Corvette onto the Camaro frame, uh, of all things, to make it um, sort of a profit center for GM. And that XP car was shelved. Well, come around 1970 and the Detroit Auto Show, GM gets wind that Ford is going to unveil their mid-engine Pantera. Uh, they hear rumblings about an AMC uh, mid-engine car by Bizzarini. There's even a mid-engine Mercedes called the C111. And uh, they decide that mid-engine is kind of hot. So Duntov says, hey, I've got this XP uh, in, the, uh, in the storage closet. You know, shouldn't we do something with it? Uh, Bill Mitchell, of course, famous GM designer, said, hell yeah. Uh, they pulled it out of the closet, they dressed it up, and they debuted it at that 1970 Detroit show as the Corvette concept. Man, it was an instant hit. Uh, people went absolutely nuts for it. The press went, people didn't know they wanted it until they saw it. And all of a sudden, it was the talk of the town uh, that there was this mid-engine Corvette. It was rumored that it was going to be the 1973 model, uh, and it became a... Um, 
Well, it became kind of an instant sensation and uh, started a buzz that would carry on for decades and decades and decades. And it was followed by more mid-engine prototypes. Uh, there was the lightweight uh, Reynolds aluminum Corvette, which they actually cut apart the first one and made it into this Reynolds aluminum Corvette, uh, which was supposed to be very lightweight, which it was, but it didn't go anywhere. Uh, then there was a two and four rotor Wankel Corvette because rotary engines were gonna be the thing. Uh, so they uh, were out in the Vega, but they decided that they wanted to be in the Corvette. Duntov hated the Wank engine, absolutely hated it. Uh, but he accepted that it was going to help him continue his mid-engined uh, drive. So he had uh, one of his engineers start creating it, who did a stellar job with it. And they made what were called the two-rotor and then the four-rotor Corvette. Uh, which, of course, kept the whole mid-engine theme going. That led to the 1967... <sighs> I had a lot of coronavirus whiskey this morning. I really did. I'm not sure that Omicron is a big deal, uh, but I'm not taking any chances, so I'm still jamming on it, and uh, that's what I did today. Sorry. 1976... Uh, Aero Corvette, which was an absolutely beautiful design and probably the first one that I remember as a kid uh, because I was building plastic models at the time and uh, I believe Ravel had come out with a model of the Aero Vet. Uh, it was right around the time like the $6 million man was out and stuff. So I was playing with some blow up $6 million man, you know, uh, tech center and also building models and one of the models I remember building was of the 1976 Aerovet uh, which really didn't mean that much to me at the time other than I knew they weren't making it but it didn't look like a pretty damn cool car uh, but anyway it, that came out that led to an Indy Corvette of the 1980s which was absolutely an insane display of technology from GM uh, even had map moving navigation before the there was really a finished military navigation. I mean, this thing was so far ahead of its time, it was insane. Uh, like 600 horsepower it had or something, uh, but was basically just a way for GM to show off. And uh, then that became the CERV-3 in the early 90s, which was much more production ready uh, in terms of when you looked at it, it had things like windows that would go down, uh, enough uh, space in the wheel wells for suspension. It had bumper height stuff you know you could tell that it was being designed as a production car uh, but uh, if they had built it using the technology they were using at the time it would have cost like 300 grand and basically that's when a ZR1 which was already pushing the limits of it being an expensive Corvette was about 60 grand so uh, obviously that's not something that they built and uh, even though it was going to be rumored to be the fifth generation Corvette they carried on with the same old front engine rear drive setup that uh, was selling very well, had historically sold very well, and uh, never really gave the accountants at GM a reason to uh, to change it up. So, um, you know, the mid-engine car was again shelved. Uh, but development continued <laughs> as it would, and uh, here it is. So it's finally culminated after all of these years, after all of Duntov's pushing, uh, in this C8 Corvette, which is now the front, uh, sorry, the first uh, mid-engine Corvette uh, culminating Duntov's dream, and uh, it's just a shame he didn't live to see it. He retired in 75, he died in the 90s, and uh, never saw that uh, his uh, ultimate dream of a mid-engine car would be produced, and that's a shame, uh, because here it is, and it's just absolutely incredible. All right, we're back. You can see there's some landscaping going on here. Uh, obviously, Peter's back in town. Uh, he's been trimming his bushes up front now that there's no more goats because he slaughtered them uh, to, uh, to trim the bushes for him. Uh, but obviously he's more interested in this. I mean, I've never known Peter to leave a job overnight. It's just not his style. Uh, but there he is. So he's cut these things. He's left all the clippings down and he hasn't picked them up. And I guess if he's not out, you know, banging Tinderellas or doing whatever the hell it is today, other than work that needs to be done, uh, then, uh, you know, he'll probably get to it. But it's just, you know, it's just more disappointment for me uh, as I'm plugging away at what it is I I do and all these wealthy people in my sphere are living life to the fullest and giggling and lighting cigars with hundred dollar bills and 
anyway, I'll try not to let my resentment linger too much, and we'll just get right back into this. And uh, having gone through that sort of beleaguered overview of how this car came to be, uh, let's just dive right into this one. The number one factor of this car, without question, is value. Uh, you know, forget that they're trading thousands over their sticker price right now. Hopefully that's something that ends when we're past all this COVID uh, chip shortage, supply chain bullshit that's causing misery for most people, including myself. And uh, we'll get back into how this is basically a base price $60,000 car. The convertible like this one is maybe seven grand more, uh, but uh, it is a tremendous value in the car world. Uh, it is in a class of its own price-wise. There's just nothing else out there that can deliver what this car does for the money that Chevrolet technically wants to ask for it. Um, one can argue that, that it had to be made uh, in order to keep the Corvette relevant. You know, I mean, a lot of cars like this, like the Mercedes SL and some other cars have become celebrations of the past and uh, they don't really end up on the cutting edge as a relevant forward thinking car that's you know changing the way people make cars or keeping competitive and Corvette decided to go the direction that they would make it that way instead of something that was based still in the popularity of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, as opposed to something all new. Uh, it also continues the historical competition with the Porsche 911, something the Corvettes have always done. And uh, it does so extremely well. I mean, the performance figures of this car are epic. And frankly, the price is more in tune with the Cayman, uh, or even the Boxster, than it is with the 911 itself. I mean, you can get into well-optioned Corvettes that's start breaching the six-figure mark, uh, but you can get an incredible example uh, for much, much less than, you know, most other cars that put in this kind of uh, performance. And when you get into some of the Italian exotics that it also ostensibly competes with, I mean, this thing is a third of its price and delivers very similar performance, and uh, you just absolutely have to hand it to them. Uh, the exterior styling... <sighs> All right, well, look, let's just get into it. The front end is very Italian. I mean, there's no question about that. And it's probably by necessity. I mean, when you look at it, uh, what else can they do? It's, you know, it's a rear mid-engine car with uh, all of the passenger stuff pushed forward. You know, the um, <laughs> no engine up front, obviously, very few mechanicals up front. Uh, there really isn't any other way than to make it look kind of Italian. Uh, the rear of the car, I would argue is much more Corvette and uh, much more American. Uh, you've got um, a hint of the four round, which, you know, obviously are long gone. Now they're square. Uh, but you've got a hint of those four famous Corvette tail lamps. You've got all sorts of scoops and vents and diffusers and quad pipes at the bottom and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, which um, I think does look more American than Italian, at least up until you get into the uh, back end of the um, the buttresses and whatnot. Uh, the sides of the car, to me, they're just not that attractive. I don't love it. Uh, you know, again, what else are they going to do? I mean, there's only so much you can do with this setup of car uh, where it has to look a certain way. But I'm not a big fan of the uh, giant air inlets at the back or uh, the way those haunches ride. When you're looking through the mirror, it almost feels like you're in a Porsche 917 or something. Those haunches uh, absolutely ride up the back and give you very limited rearward visibility, as is, of course, common with any sort of mid-engine, most, you know, slung exotic car. So um, it is what it has to be, I think. And the styling of the car, if not entirely my favorite for many angles, I still think looks pretty good. Uh, when you put the top down on the uh, convertible, it ends up with these buttresses still in place, which is obviously still very uh, Italian, and uh, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, the mirrors are shoved way out, uh, I think, again, as a necessity to try and get you past those haunches. Uh, it's got very angular, angry headlights. You've got all sorts of swoops and vents uh, in the front. I'm sure they have the radiator up front to um, uh, to induce cooling. You've got big brakes. You've got staggered wheels. Um, you know, it is what it is. And 
Well, I tell you what, let's just get into the damn thing. So under the hood and in the back, and the way you get into this thing, by the way, is a little bit convoluted in the uh, convertible. I think it's easier in the coupe. And in fact, in the coupe, there's a uh, engine dress package, which you can get, which has sort of a plexiglass uh, cover. So you can actually see the engine as the car's just sitting there parked. But apparently to get into the engine on the convertible, you have to press the lock button on this big key fob and then press and hold this top button. And theoretically, and there it is, that's going to raise the tonneau cover and reveal where the engine would be which you really don't see that much. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of Torx bolts there you could remove to get to it, uh, but otherwise it's all under that. And if you got rid of that, what you would see is a four point, uh, sorry, a 6.2 liter push rod, and God bless them for still using the push rod, uh, V8 engine called the LT2, uh, which puts out, uh, with this performance exhaust, puts out 495 horsepower, 470 foot-pounds of torque, uh, runs through an eight-speed double clutch uh, automatic transmission. There's some talk of why there wasn't a stick in this car, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, but uh, extremely advanced, extremely high tech, and very lightweight. Uh, it does zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. I mean, <laughs> and that's in the base form. And maybe three seconds. I mean, it's insanely fast. Quarter mile of 11.2. Uh, it, it pulls 1.03 on the skid pad, which does sound very impressive, but um, frankly isn't a big improvement over the hot rod versions of the C7. So, um, you know, it is hyper technical and incredibly cool, uh, even if the performance doesn't really exceed some of the fancier Corvettes of the past. Um, but it's also the, it's also just the standard modern technology that has gotten so good uh, that it's pushed things to the absolute maximum. I mean, uh, numbers like this were unheard of when I was a kid. They just didn't exist. I mean, zero to 60 times under six seconds were considered very fast. Quarter miles under 15 were fast. I mean, now it's commonplace to see cars turning in these kind of numbers, and that's much more a... Um, it's much more a result of technology advancing than it is of any particular specialness of this Corvette. Uh, Suspension-wise, it has four wishbones, double wishbones all around, and coil springs, which is a new thing for the Corvette. Obviously, in the past, it had those monoleaf um, uh, suspension setups, so it had to be all new for this mid-engine car, and uh, that's, um, that's something that was kind of neat. So, uh, it uses magnetic uh, dampers, which which uh, do, I tell you what, I, I see Peter's kid is over there in that truck. He's obviously waiting for me to finish filming. I, I just don't want, I'm going to pause it for a minute and let the kid in and then we'll get back into it. But let me get this tonneau cover back down first. And to do that, you press the lock and keep pressing this. And uh, then theoretically the tonneau cover is going to close and the, uh, yeah, the turn signals will flash. So. All right, I'm going to pause and let him come in and we'll get back to it. All right, so I'm very quickly going to do the storage on this Corvette, which, uh, you know, is not a small thing in terms of historical necessities, and we'll get into that as we go. Uh, then I'm going to get my crap inside. We'll hop in and get out of here. Uh, but here's the trunk. All right, so this is behind, of course, the engine compartment. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of bigger than you'd think. It's not bad. And I think uh, Chevy engineers went with the idea that you have to be able to bring golf clubs in your Corvette. Uh, if only Mercedes these engineers had the same idea, they'd be better off today. But um, Chevy did it. You're able to fit probably one good size bag in there, two little walk-in bags, and uh, that's the key. Of course, you can also get... Um, you know, groceries and that kind of crap in there. I see that it has hooks for an infant containment net. I don't actually see the net itself, so your infants are going to be screwed without that. They're going to be banging around the thing, especially if you get on it. Uh, but uh, if you have that you know, net deployed, then you're going to be able to stick your infants or toddlers behind that, and they're going to be pretty well secure as you're uh, doing whatever it is that you need to do. Uh, it also has a trunk suck down, not unlike a 85 Eldorado. Uh, which uh, I wasn't expecting, so I slammed it the first time and won't make that mistake again. Uh, up front, as it's a word I hate, um, 
you have a frunk, and I don't know why this button's a little touchy. It doesn't doesn't seem to work very well for me. I mean, it says press twice. I'm going to lock it, press it twice, nothing happens. I'm going to unlock it, press it twice, nothing happens. So now I'm just going to press the shit out of it. And finally, we got something happening. So anyway, there it is. Here's the frunk of the car. Uh, again, a pretty good amount of storage space there. You can put, you know, if you back into your space, you don't have to walk to the rear to put your groceries in. You just put them up front. Uh, infants, again, it's a pretty nice little playpen type area. Uh, they could even stand with the hood up if they're pretty small, and that's cool. Uh, and uh, in fact, they have a picture of an infant removing himself from uh, the car, which is nice, but um, I guess you can push that button and open it. So you might have to put a piece of tape over that to hide it. Uh, uh, for some reason, there's also a 12 volt outlet there. And uh, you can see just how stubby the front of this car is. Uh, but anyway, this one does not have a pull down. So you have to give it a pretty good Porsche style push in order to, um, uh, to get it down. But by being uh, fiberglass and not aluminum, you're not gonna dent the hood, which is nice. So anyway, there's the storage on the car and uh, I'm gonna get my crap in the back now open up the rear and uh, then we're gonna get inside and look at the interior and go for a spin all right craps in the back let's just get in this thing and see what we got um, not a big fan of the door pull uh, which is of course hidden from view it's this little pressure pad release under here uh, you pinch up and it opens I would have liked it if Chevy had gone with a more pure you know, it's probably asking too much because, of course, one of the Corvette things has always been sort of pushing the technological limits. Uh, if you remember in the 80s, they had that F-16 dashboard and, uh, you know, it's just something that they keep doing is, is making things hyper-technical and showing off their engineering skills. Uh, to me, it would have been much more interesting and much better uh, if they had just used really solid engineering to make a classically styled uh, the ergonomical setup with regular pull handles, regular analog instruments, you know, all that sort of stuff instead of this plastic, fantastic, hyper-technological tickety-tock shit that the, the snowflakes like. But, you know, it's probably just asking too much. Um, one of the eternal and ongoing complaints with Corvettes was interior build quality. Uh, you know, it just was never up to snuff. They improved it over the years as time. Obviously, the 60s and or in the 60s, it was pretty good, you know, back when GM really was at the top of their game. Uh, from the 70s to 80s to 90s, it, it just declined. It just wasn't what it was supposed to be. And you had squeaks, rattles, you had interior panels that were kind of shit and fell apart. And uh, that was an eternal complaint of the Corvette. Well, I think they've done away with that on this one. I mean, you have pretty nice stitched leather just about everywhere, you know, the seats. I think the these are called GT1 seats or something. Um, not a big fan of the steering square uh, as opposed to the steering wheel. And I think that's sort of an optional wheel on this car. I'm not positive, but I think so because some of the photos I've seen of other ones have a more rounded wheel. I mean, I get the flat bottom uh, that makes it easier to get in and out of, but the flat top seems a little bit... Yeah, I don't know, a little bit too much. Uh, you've got all your window switches here. You've actually got your top control module here and your rear uh, wind buffeter panel here as well, your mirrors. Uh, down here, you've got your lock and unlock and a push button release. There's the uh, manual release if you end up getting stuck in there. Uh, here's a little spot for gun storage underneath there where you could put, um, you know, something small, probably more switchblades or narcotics than any kind of sizable weapon and uh, that has your two uh, trunk releases uh, the seats you can see it's got a little side airbag thing up here all very nice um, it's power control on both sides it has contrasting stitching and I can tell you right now getting in and out of this car even though the doors do open nice and wide which makes it easier for me to get in and out of I rub the shit out of this bolster every time and I have a feeling that that thing isn't gonna make it for 50,000 miles before it starts looking really tired oh god there I did it again we'll see all right door closed get my seatbelt on 
we'll see what I got. Of course, uh, it's all keyless. You know, the car knows I've got the key in my pocket. Uh, I'm going to reach over and press the start stop. And everything fires to life. In fact, let me do that again without talking over it. Um, this car does have the performance exhaust sound, which comes in at startup and uh, sounds pretty good. So here it is. <laughs> that does, you know, scare the cats in your household, which is nice. Uh, the dashboard itself, you know. <laughs> Again, it's like something from Battlestar Galactica. This is kind of a base model, so it doesn't have the heads-up display, but you can see where it would have gone if it was. Um, you've got all this sort of, uh, I have to say, the stitching, and it does look very handmade, which I doubt it is. But, you know, it's not even. It's got lines in it. Um, they do a nice job of kind of making it feel... Uh, you know, tailor-made. Uh, the way these things from the side swoop up into the door, into the dash, and then into the fenders is a nice touch. And uh, the driver, you know, you've got lots of room. I actually had to move the seat forward in this, so it's not terribly small. Um, but you are ensconched in, in a real sort of fighter jet cockpit. You've got this digital display up front. I want to say it's 12 inches from side to side. Uh, you've got another smaller display off here that's angled towards you, uh, which does your phone and that sort of thing. I've got CarPlay set up, you know, I've got Bill's Eye, Apple CarPlay, whatever. It's got all that kind of crap. Let's see if we can get some music going. The bars are all closed. It's fun. Alright, so it was very easy to set that up, I have to say. It uh, uh, it didn't seem to be too hard to get the um, uh, the technology going, even for an old bastard like me. Uh, you know, the shifter mechanism, I, I find it absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what is the point of this? So you've got to pull up for reverse up here. There's your rear camera, which is great. There it is. You've got push for neutral. Uh, back here, you pull up for drive. You've got M for manual. Honestly, you know, what's the damn point? I mean, why not just have a shifter, which I think would be nicer? Uh, these cars, by the way, don't come with manuals. And uh, I remember watching a Jay Leno episode uh, a year ago when he was doing one of these cars with the head of development for the Corvette. And uh, he chastised him for not having a manual. And I can't remember the guy's name, but he said, man, Jay, you know, piss off, man. We wanted one. We'd love to do it. People don't buy them. You know, they, it's not worth the development cost because people just don't buy them. So uh, you actually can't blame Chevy for a lack of a manual, uh, even if, you know, maybe that was just horse shit because the whole world of exotic cars is moving towards all this double clutch paddle shifty crap. Uh, but, uh, you know, he did argue that, um, and it has been true since the 70s, far more automatic Corvettes were sold than manual. Uh, you've got this angular center console uh, with this absolute absolutely ludicrous climate control. I mean, without a question, this is just the most unintuitive, ridiculous thing in world history. I mean, to turn it on, you hit auto up here. You've got all the single row of buttons. I mean, forget trying to do something from memory or in a hurry. It would take you months to get the muscle memory uh, to know how to adjust anything. Really, really obnoxious in my mind, and I don't understand it at all. Uh, secondly, you've got this mouse here which you can change the modes of the car but as far as I can tell it really doesn't do anything else so unless I'm missing something I mean there's no mouse moving around the screen when I do this um, I can't really get back into the home button uh, it only seems to change the modes here so I can go to track where I get this you know pretty cool display it reminds me of the Audi we did a couple of weeks ago uh, where it changes up the digital display screen to suit your mood at the time so uh, here is the track mode where you get um, uh, your performance indicators right now we've got it on G you can do um, a lap timer you can do 0 to 60 I'll leave it on that you got your oil pressure your water temp your tires tells you if they're cool or hot uh, your oil temp um, you know, all very nice stuff and whatnot. Uh, if you change that to sport, you get that display we had. You can change that to tour. That gives you a different display altogether and tones down the uh, engine, by the way. And uh, you can go then to weather. Uh, 
uh, which uh, I guess is if you're driving in the snow or that sort of thing. Uh, there's also the programmable Z button, which I don't entirely understand why it's Z, maybe for Zora, uh, but you press that and you can program it to be what you want. So I've got it set up to go into sport mode. It changes your steering input, your suspension, uh, your engine shift, your brake feel, and your engine sound. And uh, you can make that all programmable. Um, in fact, I tell you what, we're just going to go into full track mode. What the hell? Let's drive it that way. And there you go. And that just puts everything right up to the maximum. If you turn off your traction control, you can do long, giant burnouts in the Walmart parking lot. Uh, vents, you've got these weird little things here with toggle switches that you know i'm sure they work fine but they're weird uh you've got a electric release glove box there's your books in there all very nice stuff up here you've got uh, a standard sort of rear view mirror i understand there's an optional camera that can go through that that people seem to want uh here's all your on star crap uh, if i want to run the top i'm going to push down or no i'm going to pull up on this button we'll see what happens Nothing. Maybe I have to be in park, so we can go into park. No, you don't have to be in park, because you can do it up to 30 miles an hour. All right, so I'm pulling. Maybe if I push down on it. Let's see if that does it. Yeah, there it goes. All right, so you can see the tonneau cover comes up. This whole roof lifts off, goes down into that compartment. And then the tonneau cover shoots back down. And now you've got your Corvette convertible, folding top motion complete. And you open it up so you can see that. And I believe that this design looks a lot like the uh, Italian cars that do the same thing. Uh, now, if you had the coupe, uh, it would have a couple of removable T-top panels uh, that you would then be able to store in the trunk, but this is the convertible version. Uh, you can also run up that window in the center to keep your noise buffing it down, which we're going to go ahead and do. And am I going to leave the top open? I don't know. Yeah, what the hell. It's nice weather outside. Be nice and chilly. Let's just do that. We'll also be able to hear the exhaust better. Um, We've got Apple CarPlay going. I mean, if I go into the home menu, this is where I can. I'm not going to go through all this too much. We've got a Wi-Fi hotspot. You've got apps, your Android, your Tickety Talks, your Instagrams, your Facebooks, your Marketplaces, your Chevrolet stuff, your Amazons, your, you know, all this crap. And uh, here's how you can get into uh, deck around with the settings of the car, buckle to drive. Uh, if you have that on, the car won't move unless you're buckled up. Drive mode cause air quality collision blah 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 all this shit that just bugs the crap out of me Go back to car play and we'll just stick with that so i'm gonna leave it and drive i don't think we're on manual shift and uh let's just go for a spin so you do get some nice tunes out of the pipes enough to where i don't think you really need a radio uh this is a power tilt and telescoping steering wheel so uh, you got that going for you. Uh, seating position. I tell you what, man. I mean, it's pretty tight. The side, the side of the seats are really, really keeping me firmly in there, which is nice for sporty driving. But I'm not sure how nice it is on touring. Um, real quick, if I were to turn the lights on, and then run this dimmer all the way down. Maybe the car's too smart for that. Let me see. Apparently, it is. Do we have the lights on? Yeah, can't do it. I should have done that at night. But basically, you can black out this whole instrument panel, and uh, it becomes just uh, what you need, like temperature and speed. And uh, it's probably very easy on the eyes if you're doing some night driving. All right, do we have our traction control off? I don't see any lunatics walking their dogs, so we're going to get this a quick little traction off press to dismiss we got our performance timer 0 to 60 accelerate to start all right well with our wheel spin we obviously didn't get that three second to 60 thing looks like we're 64 which is about the same as an 88 Camaro so I'm not sure what's going on with that <laughs> obviously I'm not launching right uh, but uh, yeah, we'll keep going and see what happens. Uh, but long story short, man, the car is extremely quick. I mean, 
when you're driving at this speed, it's like something your grandmother would take to the store. It's incredibly docile. Uh, it just doesn't feel very... It doesn't feel very sporty at all. And, yeah, yeah, you know, some people would argue that's great. Some people would argue it's not. And I'm one of those that argues it's not. I mean, I... I just, when I'm in a car that's this exotic, this high performance, I just want to feel it constantly. And uh, you really don't get to feel it in this car. Uh, technology has advanced to such a stage, these magnetic ride control shocks can soak up the road. The thing feels like an Eldorado uh, when you're just driving normally, even in friggin' track mode. It feels like an Eldorado. I mean, the steering input's as tight and precise as it's gonna be, and it's still kind of casual. I mean, that is a lot of fun to hammer. I'm sure it's a lot more fun to paddle shift, but holding the camera, I'm not gonna do that. Um, now we got a car turning in front of us. Uh, the steering response is amazing, absolutely amazing. And of course, that's not just technology, it's also the inherent um, qualities of having a mid-engine car with absolutely no weight uh, over the front wheels. It just allows them to be that much more snappy and responsive. And uh, I have a feeling that driving this thing around the racetrack would be absolutely epic, epic. Let's see if we can put the top up while we're cruising around. Reduce vehicle speed. Well, how much more can I reduce it? Nothing. Okay, here it goes. All right, so we're gonna get that top back up so it's not so windy. This is supposed to happen fairly quickly, which it is. Seals up there, now it comes in the back, all very nice stuff. I keep my finger on that button and the windows go up. So there we are in good shape. Now it gets actually very quiet in here. And uh, again, that's part of the shtick. <laughs> I mean, it is fun to drive. But look, man, like I argued with that Audi a couple of weeks ago, uh, these things have gotten so good, they've gotten so technologically perfect that they've actually become boring. They're just too good at what they do. Um, you know, the soul is gone. You get in like a, a 1971 Ferrari Daytona with all the clicking carburetors or an old Porsche with the whirring and the, you know, the sounds from the engine and, and it's more rewarding. You get in a, even a fairly late model Miata and it just feels like you're more connected and in tune uh, with the machine, more analog. Uh, than you feel in these hyper-technical supercars. Uh, but honestly, I'm going to go easy on the Corvette. And part of the reason is that they finally did it. You know, they finally built this mid-engine Corvette that they had been threatening for years. And uh, I'll give them great credit for that. And uh, the other part of it is it's a Corvette. <laughs> It's a Corvette, so the hell with it. I'm gonna like it against my will. And uh, that is gonna end up being the, I don't know, to me, the final judgment of this car. You know, when I took it from Dave, when I drove it home, I thought, man, this is really gonna disappoint me because it's just too modern, it's too much, it's too perfect, it's too technological. I'm not gonna feel connected to it and, um, and despite all that, even though there is some truth to that, I do. I do like it. I do like driving it. I do feel connected to it. And uh, I can appreciate what a tremendous bargain it is uh, in the car world. That it can outperform cars two or three times its cost. And that it can really take it to the, uh, to the Europeans and the supercars. Uh, and really keep up the side for Corvette and for General Motors and for America at large. I just do like it. So anyway, there it is. Uh, this car, not for sale, not one of the auto house inventory cars, just something I borrowed from Dave. Thanks again to Dave the Wholesaler for letting me use it. And um, 
It's a 2021 Stingray convertible, uh, neat car, and uh, hopefully some more fun stuff to come. So I'm back in business, I'm back home. Uh, I did pick up a couple of cars at Meekum, we'll get videos on those. Uh, I did babysit the car I was selling, and that thing did sell, so uh, all in all, mission accomplished. But it's nice to be back in the swing of things, and uh, we're going to have some more fun videos coming up. So thank you very much for having a look, appreciate it, and we will see you with the next one. Take care.